Let's pray. Father, my heart's desire tonight is that in part because of what we do here now together, there would be no wasted lives in this room and in the hearing of my voice, and there would be no wasted deaths. I pray that you would bring a significance and a power and a meaning to the lives in this room, and I pray that you would use that significance and power and meaning to make every death count for your glory. Whether it happens quickly or whether it happens 50 or 60 years from now. I pray, Lord, that if we're not able to trade in our pain or shame or suffering in this life, we would not postpone the joy, but rather find it in the pain, in the shame, in the suffering. So come now and help me to make your word plain. Grip, I pray, these young people and don't let them waste their lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So here we are gathered on the 29th of December 2003 and the body count as we meet from the earthquake in BAM, Iran, is at about 25,000. That's a lot of human lives snuffed out at 528 in the morning. And you feel the personal weight of it when you read about a father digging through the blocks of his house looking for a daughter and a wife and uncovering a dead hand and passing out for grief. Or when you read about a little baby being found alive in the grip of a dead mother, puts a face on it. And what makes this event here at the end of 2003 feel so apocalyptic for some of us is not the magnitude of it, though it's ten times bigger than 9-11 but how many other events were packed together with it, right? Thirteen people buried in a mudslide in California, six buried under an avalanche in Utah, 111 dead in a plane crash in Benin, 198 dead and poisoned from gas in China, all packed together in a few days at the end of the year. And it just takes your breath away and makes us ask, what would Jesus want us to learn from this? About not wasting our lives. And I think if we go to Jesus and ask Him that, He has something ready to say to us. And it's found in Luke 13. You don't need to go there. This is not my main text. I just want to read you what Jesus, I think, would say. Do you remember the situation? Uh, some people came to Jesus and told him about this atrocity in which Pilate had killed people while they were offering their sacrifices and he had taken their blood and mingled it with the blood of their sacrifices just to mock them. And they came to Jesus and said, what about that? Give an accounting of the Almighty here. And here's what Jesus said. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
Now, don't make a mistake here. Jesus could weep with those who wept. Jesus had compassion almost everywhere he turned. But he knows and you know that after a season of extraordinary, racking grief in calamity, it begins to ease up and the questions come. And when they come to Jesus with these questions, he does not settle for sentimentality, trying to make everybody feel good, trying to get God off the hook. That is not the way Jesus responds. Jesus says, Are you astonished at the magnitude of this calamity in Galilee? or at the magnitude of the calamity of the falling tower in Siloam? I will tell you what to be astonished at. Be astonished you weren't under the tower. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Means everybody in this room deserves to die and perish tonight. That's the way Jesus answered this inquiry about whether God could give an accounting of the deaths of the tower and Pilate's atrocity. So, when you compare that earthquake to us tonight, I think Jesus would say, Unless you repent, the thing you should be astonished about is that this hotel hasn't come down on all of us. Our wonderment shouldn't be that 25,000 people perished in a moment, but that we have not yet been snuffed out. That's what should amaze us, Jesus says. So, I conclude from this event and this sets the stage for my message that your life is in God's hands. Your life hangs by a slender thread of sovereign grace tonight. You belong to God. He made you. You exist for Him. God made life. He knows what life is for. And He has a right to take it and a right to give it whenever he pleases. You remember Job? First chapter? All ten of his children in an Iran-like calamity because the house fell on all ten of them and killed them. And Job gets the word. And here's what it says happened. He tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground and worshipped and said, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or as he said twelve chapters later, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Do you remember Hannah? She wanted a baby so bad, and she was barren for years. And then God heard her prayer, and she conceived and bore Samuel. And when she offered up Samuel, she sang a song. And listen to one of the lines in Hannah's song. 1 Samuel 2.6 the Lord kills, and the Lord brings to life. The Lord brings down to Sheol and raises up. She had read her Bible well, or learned it well from tradition. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See, now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand.
If any of you lives through the night, or if I do, it will be sheer grace. Jesus' brother, James, was tremendously gripped by this truth. I think James would have looked out across America and seen almost nothing but pride and arrogance because of what he said in chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go up to such a town and trade a while and make profit. What? You don't know your life. You are but a vapor. You ought rather to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do such and such. But as it is, you boast, and all such boasting is evil. Which means, if the Lord lives, if the Lord wills, John Piper will finish this message and not keel over. And if the Lord wills, you will not fall out of your chair dead tonight. And if He wills the opposite, you will. And He will have done you no wrong because your life is in His hands. He made you. He owns you. The Lord gives. The Lord takes. And He never does anyone wrong. Whether He takes them at one month, one year, one decade, or one hundred years, you belong to God. And hey, He may do with you as He pleases. You are His. And therefore, He knows what life is for. And the only way not to waste a life is to key off of the Almighty to know what He would have you be. Jesus has something to say about it because He's really jealous that you don't waste your life tonight. Really jealous. You're all students. Most of you are students. And therefore, most of your life is in front of you for most of you, not all of you. Some of you have already lived most of your life. But for most of you, it feels like it could go on a long time. And Jesus is very jealous that you not waste it. If he were here, I think he would say, a person's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Life is not about accumulation. It's not about getting stuff. I think that's what Jesus would say to you right off the bat in America. And then he would tell a parable. A land of a rich man produced plentifully and he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for you for years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. And God said to him, Fool, I tell you, I don't ever want to hear that word addressed to me from God. Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you prepared, whose will they be? So it is with everyone who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God.